session of this conference. My name is Lena Rus, and I here represent the Forum for Jewish Studies at Uppsala University, and I will be moderating this session. The format for the following session is as follows. First, we will have our first keynote address by Professor Moshe Hagata. Uh, then we will have short reflections of uh, three distinguished uh, Haidea alumni, uh, and that will sort of set us off on a discussion that uh, you in the audience are most welcome to participate in as well. And then in the end, we will have some concluding remarks by Karin Setteholm, who is a Jewish Studies scholar from Lund University. So without further ado, it's my great pleasure to introduce our first keynote speaker, Professor Moshe Haibatov, who is Professor of Philosophy at the Hebrew University of Jerusalem. He is also a senior fellow of the Shalom Hafman Institute, and of course, chairman of Paideya's Academic Committee. Uh, he is a very pro prolific writer and uh, has received both the Rothschild Foundation's Bruno Award and the Goan Goldstein Award. Uh, as a medievalist, for me, I mostly know him as a Maimonides expert and, of course, an expert in uh, medieval Jewish thought. But uh, if you peruse his publications, his interests go far beyond that into the philosophy of halakha and political theory and ethics. So please welcome Professor Moshe Hagedan. Thank you for, for <coughs> inviting me and, and thank you for the warm welcome. Yeah. Yeah. Yes, I, I will. I will. Okay. And really it's an honor and a, and a pleasure, both uh, in honoring of Barbara's achievement and given that our theme is home, this is a home for me as well. So, and for many other people. So Excuse me. We can't hear you. Okay. 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 I, I will, okay. That's, that's better? Yes. Okay. So, uh, I, I just, I thank Barbara for making Paideia a home for all of us. And the, the subject matter for, for this conference is home. It's a very complex category very deep on so many levels. And what I would like to do is to offer some foundations uh, in understanding what is home. What is home? What do we mean by home? Why is it so humanly vital and important? And how home can be betrayed as well. There is a betrayal of home as well. And this just offering, I would say, starting thoughts for, for our conference at large. Many things are being done at home, and there are very, a great variety of homes. But I think there is one, I'm, I'm starting from a very straightforward, simple observation. I think there is one thing that we all do at home, and I would dare say in all cultures, there's one thing, which is to sleep. We sleep at home. By the way, quite a lot of our time in life we do that. Third of our life, fourth of our life, we do at home. When we say that someone is a homeless, and we're shocked by that, we mean that he sleeps in the streets. He has no home. We eat outside. We do many things outside. Sleeping is at home. Now, this is a straightforward observation. I think culturally, I would dare say, it's almost universal. What does it mean? What can we learn from it? And here I'll, I'm going to start with a, I, I would say, phenomenological conceptual definition of home. Home is a place in which the threshold, threshold of alertness can be lowered. We don't have to be on guard. 
By the way, we can even be non-alert, sleep. The threshold of alertness is lower. And it's uh, vitally important for human life that there is such a space where can we lower the threshold of our alertness, that we cannot, we don't have to be on guard. Why, why is it that home provides us with the capacity to relieve ourselves from the burden of being intensely alert? We can say two things. First of all, it's familiar. When you come to a place, unfamiliar place, you don't know to read the nuances, you're a stranger, you don't know the next move, you don't know your way around, you enter into a state of kind of alertness, which is almost vital to your survival. As a human moving in space, home is a place that we read very well. We read home very well. We know its corners, we know its shapes, we know its moves. And also the people who surround us. Uh, we think, we hope, we presume that they have good intentions towards us, that they care for us. So we can lower the threshold of alertness. And we might say, by the way, that this is a deep human good. I would say, sir, it's very, it's very hard to imagine any possibility of human flourishing, where humans can develop and flourish without that sense of space where they can be not on guard. By the way, Maimonides is very interesting. When he speaks about exile, I mean, well, Maimonides didn't like the category of the sacred land. For Maimonides, exile is a political condition. And he said, in exile, it's very hard to achieve flourishing, in the particular exile in which he was. Because um, the anxiety of maintenance burdens you in such a way that the, the mind, the soul is not free to explore, to develop, etc. So uh, that's my starting definition. If you ask me, what is home then? What is so crucial about home? It's a space you don't have to be on guard, where levels of alertness are lowered. By alertness, I mean uh, the Hebrew term is konenut. You know, there is a military alertness. You know, where. Uh, apropos sleeping, if you've been a soldier, you know that when you're alert, you sleep with your shoes. There is someone always awake. And we know, by the way, as people at home, how our sense of home is violated when someone breaks into the house when we are asleep. And we feel it's not safe to sleep here. And then different alarm systems and other things are being introduced just to take us a little bit off guard. By the way, psychologically speaking, the fact that we can sleep makes us unalert to different things that will come from the inner soul, from, you might say, the unconscious, where in Freud's term, terminology, the sensor is also asleep or with one eye open. I want to move from this very human basic notions of homeless. Which is a lot about basic sense of security, of not being on guard, not looking behind, <coughs> not looking over your shoulder all the time. To talk about the concept of social alertness, not only security, physical alertness, but social alertness and also the extension of the concept of home, not only to the four walls that we inhabit, but to the public space, the homeland, the place you feel at home. Not your private space, but the place you feel, what, what do we mean by that? And I wanna talk about another human good or another human issue, 
which is really at the center of so much of our life today, politically speaking, but not only politically, about social alertness, being on guard socially. <coughs> but in order to explain that fully or try to articulate that sense of, <coughs> of alertness, I want to talk about shame. And what is shame? Now, so allow me to move into a philosophical mode, but I promise not to be obscure. This is a disease of philosophers, <laughs> and it's always a bad sign. I always, when my grandfather told me, Talmud, he says, if you cannot explain it to grandmother, it means you didn't understand it. <laughs> it's a good group. So he would send me to explain to, who's, my grandmother was very smart, so it wasn't that difficult. <laughs> But in any event, I want to talk about the concept of shame and the category of shame and the concept of being at home in relation to shame. Now, philosophers ask, I don't want to, they ask what's exactly the <coughs> distinction between guilt and shame, feeling guilty, feeling shame. And some of them says there is an observer. With shame, you're being observed. There is an observer. And, uh, you know, Sartre has this beautiful example of someone peeking through a hole into a room, you know, voyeuristically speaking, and then he's being watched by someone else doing the watching, and he's caught full of shame, right, by, by being watched doing it. And that's a good example in which watching needs a watcher to make you feel ashamed. But there are some other philosophers, among them I would say myself, that you don't need actually the observer for that type of shame to constitute shame. Sometimes you can be your own observer, right? By the way, you can read letters you wrote many years ago and say, wow, I'm really ashamed here. How could I have written that, right? Or, by the way, you can catch yourself in an action looking yourself from the outside and say, I'm ashamed of what I'm doing. But one thing that the observer does, it triggers, it triggers you to look at yourself through the eyes of the observer, which sometimes you can be imagined yourself without an observer. But there is shame that actually is constituted by the observer, and I want to explain that level of shame. And this has to do with things you do that there is nothing wrong in them. You're not, you're not looking at someone's room. You're just singing in the shower. There's nothing wrong to sing in the shower. But it happens to be that you realize that the whole neighborhood is listening to you. <laughs> then you feel ashamed. Or you're looking at yourself attentively at the mirror, checking a certain blemish that you think you have. And then there is someone who's actually watching you doing it. And these are moments in which the observer actually constitutes the shame. Because there is nothing wrong, presumably, in what you're doing as such. Now, what, what, is this, what are these moments about? What are these moments about? They really touch the core of our, whom we are as selves. Because the self, as a condition, the human self as a condition, is the self that represents itself. You know, you might say there are many uh, definitions to humans. The thinking animal, the talking animal. The, I would say the animal that dresses up. Uh, right? The animal that puts on a show. And we like to control the way we present ourselves. It's a deep feature of whom we are. We want to show ourselves in a particular way to particular people. And this is why, essentially, we are concealed. If all our thoughts would be written in our forehead, we wouldn't have a self. A self is deeply concealed and revealed. What happens in moments of shame? In moments of shame, we realize we don't control our own self-presentation. We don't have the basic control in the way we present ourselves. I don't know, 
a, a, a photo of us or a picture of us is up there in the internet. We don't want to be seen like that. That's not the way we choose to show ourselves to the world. And we are filled with shame. It touches the core of the self. This is why, by the way, when you, when you experience shame, you want to disappear. Right? We say guilt is a stain that we want to wash. Shame paints the whole self. We want to not be. <clears throat> the sense that we have some control of the way we appear in the world that is harmed by experiences of shame. By the way, this is why and it's so basic to whom we are ourselves that we have such a level of space, autonomy to appear. This is why we know that in different places where humiliation is practiced, a person's capacity to appear is taken from that person completely. He's shaved, he's dressed in a certain way, he doesn't control the mode of his appearance. I remember when Saddam Hussein was caught. They wanted to humiliate him. I don't, I don't know if you remember that TV scene, right? They kind of checked it publicly. You don't control the way you appear. You don't have any control over that. We have humiliated you. That's a sense of humiliation always connected to a deep sense of helplessness. And this is a helplessness in a very basic level. By the way, old age, when you don't control bodily functions, that's, we know with very deep sensibility to that sense of being humiliated by that fact. I want to say another thing in relationship to that category of shame which is the power to appear and the loss of power to appear, that here the, the opposite of shame is not shamelessness, but is intimacy. Right. I intimacy means that you reveal to someone something about you which you're not going to reveal to other people. If you are a complete exhibitionist, you're not capable of intimacy. Right? Intimacy, intimate, Exposure is related to areas in your life which are ordinarily guarded by shame. Right? This is why, by the way, past, past intimacy is always vulnerable to retroactive shame. That's true. Sometimes we have intimate moments, we look backward at them and we don't feel good about that. I want to come back to home in relationship to shame and intimacy. Because home is where you are relieved of the burdens of a period where intimacy is possible. <coughs> where the human good of intimacy is possible. I, I want to say one one important thing is there are some people at home, in some societies, <coughs> that they can see everything, not because you're intimate with them, the butler. He sees everything. But not because we're intimate with them, but because actually they are just a furniture in the room. Right? We know this is also practices of humiliation. We know that. If uh, I know some bosses, when they want to humiliate those who are underneath them, they do some intimate things before them as if they are not there. Right? One way to dehumanize the other is to say that this sight doesn't cause shame. Right? That's a form of humiliation. But at the home, free of what I would call the, the social burden of alertness, where you are unburdened by it, in a good home, in a good home, where you unburdened by it, 
There is the capacity, the great human capacity of intimacy that comes with that. And we know, by the way, that invasion of privacy or violations of privacy have to do with the fact that home is presumed to be a free area of appearances that is invaded by those from the outside. And this is not the way you wanted to present yourself to the world. You want some space to explore. And the greatness of home is the, you know, the capacity to sing often. <laughs> you know, sometimes, you know, good homes, sometimes you see the children sing freely. Right? Children, especially adolescents, they are very sensitive to shame. Right? If there is one acne, right? First of all, they think that everybody looks at them all the time. And second, when they see them, it's just one big acne. <laughs> it's a great sense. Of, and then there is some space at home, right, where they, they're free, relieved of the burdens of a period. The relief of the burdens of a period, which is a great quality of home. So, when we won't go to the social realm, and I want to talk a little bit about the social realm. What does it mean to make someone feel at home in the public space? You know that there are societies, and you would say a measure of a good or not good societies will be what degree of social alertness they impose on the stranger. You come to a place, you have never been there, and the level of being on guard shifts from the place, from one place to the other. There are places where you are just on guard. By the way, you don't exactly know why, but that's, by the way, one of the reasons you are on guard, because you don't know exactly why. Just on guard. You don't understand the nuances, you don't read people's intentions, you don't know what's next, and you just, on guard, and whatever, by the way, one good, one good strategy to deal with it is to hide who you are, to melt, to become anonymous in the crowd, so not to be spotted. And then there are societies where somehow you land in their elbow and you don't feel on guard. Right? This is not two great different societies, but it's just a personal experience. Again, nothing dramatic, because this is a great society. When I go to England, and I, let's say, visit the college in Oxford, Cambridge, or whatever, I always feel that I'm stepping on a mine without actually knowing what. But it's full of nuances that I don't read. And not only that, I feel that my environment is looking at me and says, wow, we see it. We're actually having some fun in you tightening the rope around your neck. It's all symbolically, so it's fine. Nothing dramatic is happening. But you feel, because it's full, it's a kind of a, a very delicate, unspoken net of practices that are there to, there it's mainly class, that are there to distinguish the insiders, the outsiders, etc. It's full, you, 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 end, you come to the table, you know you're going to make mistakes there with the fork, with the knife, with this glass before, with that glass before. It takes an insider not to, you know, not to fail in, in signaling. And therefore you prefer not to eat. I <laughs> <laughs> would rather be an anorectic in this place. <laughs> You'll bring your own sandwich to your room or whatever. I don't like to eat this. That, that. Or you constantly watch. You're not going to be the first one to pick the glass or whatever. I'm just saying the following. That uh, societies are measured in the way they make people feel at home. By that I mean 
that they can give them a sense that they don't have to be on guard while being whom they are. While being whom they are, they don't have to be on guard, but to look. And they even, not only that, they, uh, and they might not, by the way, know, understand all the nuances. But the price of mistake is not a market. And not only that, the nuances are still relatively open. You can learn them. They're not a closed, coded set of signals. And also, the price of not fully controlling this set of singles is not dramatic. Now, I, I want to say one, one thing which I think is essential. You ask yourself, how is this environment created? It's such an important human good. It's an essential human good. By the way, not caught by the language of rights. It's not the right to life, the right to property. It's not, you cannot, you know, I, if there would be, I don't know, lawyers here that say, okay, we have now a new right. The right not to be on guard. <laughs> I mean, it doesn't capture it. It actually envelops all movement wherever life is, rights are practiced. But we know that it's a deep <laughs> social and human good. This is why home is, is a deep human good. Being at home. Because we know the toll, the deep human toll of being on guard and the deep human good of being free from the burdens of a period. Or you might say the burdens of another period. <clears throat> how, deeply, how deeply we crave home for that. And there are different ways in which this is created. One way, unfortunate way, is uh, the creation of a closed society. You will be only with people you know. You know their language. Everything is familiar. They're yours, so you don't have to be on guard. This, in some ways, ways where the home are created. They're locks. They're, they're guards. By the way, I, I look at my own life. I see the history of the lock. When I grew up, you know, there was a lock. I, there wasn't a lock even. There was this key to the house that you can basically use any key to open. Then comes the lab pariah. I don't know how to interpret it. This is a kind of a steel door. Security Rebel. door. Rebel. What? Rebel. Security door. Security door. Then comes the, inter the intercom. Then comes the portal. All guests must be announced. Then comes the, the camera that is out there away from the house, you know, kind of. 300 meters away from in the estate. And then one very interesting function of home, maybe that's an observation of home, and that has to do with class, different class structures, is what, what happens in many homes, now I'm talking, I'm seeing New York as an example, is that the high class living brings more and more functions of the outside to the home so not to have that much friction with society as a whole. So you have a pool in the home, you have a gym in the home, you might have even a small movie theater. So there is a creation of uh, unguardedness by locking yourself in a kind of an inward castle. We, we know it's, it's important. By the way, there is a Talmudic, a very interesting Talmudic uh, text. This is the Laws of Neighbors, the Tractat Baba Batra in the Talmud, in the Mishnah, talks about laws of neighbors. The neighbor, the category of the neighbor, is another idea for a conference. 
the category of the neighbor. Sometimes more important than the family, the friend, the neighbor. <laughs> so this is a, a, a tractat, a chapter in the Talmud that is about regulating no neighborly relations. Many complex things with neighbors, right? <coughs> you both bestow, bestow benefits that are not asked for on neighbors. You also do damages that are not asked for them while using innocently your own environment. It's a very complex human legal interaction. But there is one interesting, very interesting law, al in the Talmud about neighbors. The Mishnah <coughs> says, right, in, in, uh, in the, the first chapter of Baba Batra, it says, Kofim oto not beichar vedelet lachatzer. One, uh, each member of the courtyard can enforce the other resident in the courtyard to build a door. Beichar will be a, a house for the guard. You know, in Yiddish they would say a butke. That's also a Hebrew name. Some might can Hebrewize a small place where he is there. And, and uh, this is an actual thing that we can force one another to pay. I, I don't know, a good analogy will be a, a, a residence of a building decides to build an intercom. And they can, uh, it, it, it's not the case that one of the neighbors would say, I didn't want it, you can do it, I'm not sharing the, the price of it. No, no, he has to pay for it. It's the door. Very important to create some space, guarded space. But the Talmud is, asks a very interesting question. And it says, the Talmud asks, that means that actually having a bootke, having a, a gate is actually something worthwhile. And then a story. That saintly person, they have a Gagil Eliyahu le Mishtai Ba'adei. Eliyahu, the prophet, used to appear to him. He, he was so uh, mystically pious that he had mystical visitations on a daily basis from Elijah the prophet. He had revelations all the time from Elijah. Avad Beichar, that pious person actually built that form of an obstacle at all. The two lo mishtai ba'adei. Elijah stopped coming to him. And then Rashi, because Rashi has a, the quality of Rashi's interpretation. This is just one of the Rashi moments. And Rashi says, why, the lo mishtai ba'adei, why did Elijah didn't come to him anymore? And he says, he says, the gate, the, this, stops the voice of the poor that are crying, and the voice is not heard. It's an interesting Rashi. And then the Talmud, typically to the Talmud, tries to, this is an uh, architectural challenge, how to build a, a, a gate that doesn't block the voice of the poor. <laughs> right? There is actually quite fantastic discussions here about that. But it raises a problem. It raises a problem of creating homes by excluding. In this case, excluding the, how can the poor hear you when, when how can you hear the poor where all your activities basically can done in your estate? You can swim, you can this, you can that. And then if someone wants to, I don't know, bring you in Puri, Mishloach Manot, he has to first visit, you know, see in the camera from 500 meters, talk to anonymous voice, open, move, show this, show that. You don't want to come there anyhow. <laughs> so, so we had, and the other way of, of creating the, that initial very important space is saying 
you know, we are, we are such a community that the stranger is not a threat. And by the way, by the stranger not being a threat, he responds in kind. Doesn't feel immediately the need to be on guard. And you create a different society. I want to speak about my last remark, my last thought about home. And I said, you know, I think about, I think about the lecture and the conference, and think about what do we say about home. I said, well, here I come, I propose a, a certain thought. Home is a place where you can be off guard, lower the threshold of your alertness, both physically and socially. You're free from the burden of appearing. Hence, there is a space for intimacy. Then you say, OK, what is the public realm? What do we mean by making someone, what is a homeland? What does it mean to make someone feel at home? Means that he doesn't have the, the stiffness or the, the sense that, that, that he has to be on guard. Socially, physically. I, there, is a, there is an element in which, and we know this is a kind of an idealized version of home, to a certain degree. There are, we, have, we have flashes of that, we have memories of that in good places of home. But we know when actually you have to be on guard at home, that's already, if I would say, give me a good philosophical definition of hell, that will be hell. Where the home becomes a front, where you really have to be on guard. Or you might say even more so, this is where trauma begins. Right? Trauma, abuse, what is so wrong? What is so horrible with abuse in the family? I mean, abuse is always horrible. But it comes at a place where suppose you should have been secure. You should have been off guard. Right? And, and then, if God forbid there is such an abuse, you lose your capacity to read the world. There is no place you will feel secure anymore anywhere. Because at that place where you thought it's fine, you were violated, right? We, we know, we understand that reality, the betrayal of home. It's much worse than so many other experiences of harm. Because our beginning sense of our capacity to read the world begins at home and enlarge at home. This is a place we can read nuances. We know it, it's familiar. If that place is unread for us, nowhere. That's, that's where you, you're drawn to insanity. You lose a sense of causality. You don't know what will come, what. Then heightened anxiety and a breakdown of all sense of reality, which leads you to madness. This is, by the way, the analogy, the social analogy of that, of that breakdown is civil war. This is, I would say, the national betrayal of home, the abuse of the, the homeland. Right? And you read different moments of civil war, which are the worst of all wars, when neighbors turn against one another, those who actually live together, side by side. Right? You, read, you read the accounts of Bosnia, or Iraq today, Sunnis and Shiites were living together. They weren't on guard. But there is a, when there is a breakdown of home, it's where abuse or trauma comes. There's a betrayal of, of that precious human space where you should be of God. So I, I'm, I'm starting with these observations uh, about the home, the nature of home, the good that home brings us. What does it mean to make the homeland, the public space, 
home. And I just want to finish with one Talmudic story, which I think is a great puzzle about home. It's a beautiful story about another Hasid. And he saw someone throwing garbage and dirty stuff from his home to the public space. You know that. <laughs> Off the window or something. Certain places it happened more than other places. And then he says to him, why are you throwing all this dirt from a place that you don't own to a place that you own. And he said, he, he mocked him, what do you mean? After a few years he lost his home and he met that person, he says, I understand you. It's, very, it's a very interesting observation. After all, the public space is a more of a safer in terms of our place than our private space. So we might lose it, we might change. The public space is always there. So, I want to end up with that observation, complex observation about the boundaries of home, the shape of home. And again, thank you, Baba, for, for first of all, removing us from the burdens of appearance, allowing us to be who we are, and, and uh, and creating that space of human flourishing, of the flourishing of Jews, of Jewish life that doesn't have to hide. It appears there. And uh, wishing Fania whom I know for many years, and I know she comes with all the right credentials. <laughs> and also our best support and love to, to make that place flourish even more. So thank you, and I'll end here. Thank you very much.